No. All right, that's all you get. <laughs> Maybe the sun will come out. I don't know. We're having a very gloomy morning. So are we. So, Wolf, I should just warn okay. you in advance that um, I live in a marina that my little corner of the marina has been infested with harbor seals who are very loud and sometimes they just start barking. <laughs> so if they do, I'll just mute myself. <laughs> All right. The problem. That is wonderful. And uh, we also live, so the audience knows that as well. So if they hear a strange background noise, it will be harbor seals. So welcome okay. everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have another fantastic Liberty at Home series. And today we have the great fortune to talk about this wonderful big book, which is Welfare for the Witch. And the subtitle is how your tax dollars end up in millionaires' pockets. And this is fantastic that we talk about this because we as Students for Liberty, we are a free market organization. We are in favor of free enterprise, but very often people say like, oh, you are just uh, in favor of the rich getting richer and of them just lobbying government uh, to become more powerful. And that's how often people depict folks of like a pro-liberty um, opinion. However, this is very far from the truth, and um, especially the individuals in this call, Phil Harvey and Lisa Conyers, did a fantastic job looking at how rich people get welfare right now, mostly with a focus on the United States. And I would really recommend you to get out of this book. It's very scholarly, and they have experience writing books together, so they are already like a well-functioning team. And uh, to their credentials, let me introduce both of them. First, uh, Phil Harvey has two very successful businesses. He is an entrepreneur. He's also the chairman of uh, Adam and Eve. And in that capacity, he is not only um, making money, producing value for millions of individuals, but he is also a fantastic philanthropist. So much so that he is active, um, his nonprofit is active in 70 countries fighting um, the HIV crisis that we have and giving to a number of other worthwhile causes. If that wasn't enough, He's a man who's not putting only the money where his mouth is, but he's also uh, fighting injustices here in this country um, because he sued the federal government and he won a lawsuits because uh, his free speech and the free speech of his company were infringed upon and he was successful in winning those things. So very interesting um, individuals we have here. And Lisa is his co-author and they have published several books together and the other one besides the welfare for the rich is the cost of human welfare. And we might be touching upon that book as well. It's very interesting. And Lisa is an economist and she's a consultant and, uh, and a writer. She has published uh, many different pieces and she's writing also regularly um, for outlets like the New York Daily News, Los Angeles Times and the Huffington Post. With that all being said, Phil, Lisa, welcome so much. And I hope you're having a good day. How are you? Okay, thank you. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> Absolutely. And now the question is what, to start us off with, what is it that motivated you to write this book at this particular moment in time? Because you spent two years of researching, traveling around and putting a lot of your energy and lifeblood into this. What motivated you to write it? Well, the work that we did on the regular welfare, what you might call the regular welfare program, that is uh, the welfare programs that were the subject uh, of our last book in 2016, um, led us to uncover a lot of problems with the regular welfare program, but uh, at least it, it is designed and intended for and reaches a low income people, a great many people who in fact are very poor. In the process of, of uh, researching and writing that book, we kept coming across instances where government subsidies and outright uh, payments were being made in a manner that looked and felt and seemed like welfare to us, uh, but the beneficiaries were very wealthy people often. Um, um, including some billionaires and a lot of millionaires. And we said, well, we, to complete this subject, we certainly ought to have a look, a good close look at the welfare payments and subsidies that are going to the rich uh, to complete this picture. And uh, we also felt this will shock a lot of people 
uh, nobody supports the idea uh, of welfare for the rich. Uh, everyone, or a great majority, I would say, of the American people in principle are willing to pay taxes to help people who are less fortunate, uh, but nobody, uh, uh, Republican, Democrat, left, right, center, libertarian, uh, tries to make at least theoretically a case for taking taxpayer money and making rich people richer. Now, when one's own ox is gored, all of a sudden um, uh, the justification for these uh, subsidies uh, tends to uh, leap forward in great detail. Uh, but in principle, um, uh, Robin Hood tends to be approved of, and the Sheriff of Nottingham uh, is generally thought to be bad uh, by people of all political stripes. And uh, in your research, what would you say has been like one of the most egregious examples of corporate welfare or welfare for the rich that made you really outraged when you, when you realized what was happening? Do you want to pick one, Lisa? There are a lot to choose from. <laughs> there's a lot to choose from. I mean, there's some that to me just is, irkled me more than others just because of how frivolous they were. So for example, sports stadiums. Why in the world is any taxpayer in America spending a dime on a professional sports team stadium? Now, you know, financial, you know, if you look at the finances of it, it's small potatoes compared to say the egg subsidies, uh, no pun intended. Um, but in terms of just the the injustice of it, that, those are the ones that really got me were the sports stadiums, the film subsidies. Why are we paying Hollywood to make movies in New Mexico or Hawaii or wh whatever the case may be? So especially when it didn't seem to have any public purpose whatsoever, except for entertainment, I think those are the ones that frustrated me the most. Um, not that there can be a case made for paying millionaire farmers to farm or not farm or, uh, you know, data centers to be built for Amazon for free. But um, but there's some where you could see how some taxpayer might have been convinced to spend some money. But the, but the you know, professional sports teams don't need my tax dollars. And neither does the NASCAR business. There's no. a special task, tax break for NASCAR <laughs> tracks and owners. Yeah, is, and is, it, is that your favorite one, Phil? Like, I mean, least favorite one to say? Well, uh, the top of my list is usually a woman named Penny Pritzker um, of the Illinois Pritzkers. She's probably a very nice person. I have no reason to think she isn't, uh, but she's a billionaire, literally a billionaire, uh, an heiress to the Chicago Mill and Lumber Company. Uh, and apparently owns some agricultural property. She's not a farmer by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but she got $1.6 million of taxpayer money under the farm bill uh, in a recent period. Um, uh, now, this woman does not ride a tractor. I think we can be quite sure of that, but she happens to own some properties uh, that are agricultural properties. Uh, so we write her a check. There's simply no basis for writing checks to millionaires who aren't even farmers under the farm bill. Yeah, that seems like uh, a lot of abuse right there. Um, yeah, and why would that be the case? It just seems to be that some law became like more and more complicated and so people who should not take advantage of it, take advantage of it. And uh, generally, you are very skeptical about the value of subsidies generally. And I think you also recommend to get rid of all of them. Is that, is that your opinion, that we should just get rid of subsidies um, everywhere? Or do you have a slightly different opinion on this? Well, it's, uh, the short answer is we would generally favor getting rid of all subsidies. But there are exceptions under the present circumstances, for example. I think the idea of helping small businesses, if they are small businesses, uh, retain their employees during this pandemic uh, is probably justified, and that is a form of, of subsidy. Um, there are even some businesses, I have some sympathy with the airlines that just got walloped uh, by this pandemic, 
uh, through no fault of their own. I have some sub, uh, some sympathy with uh, providing some help to them and a few others. Um, but uh, generally speaking, um, there's a saying in libertarian circles, friends don't subsidize friends. Subsidies generally are very bad for the people who receive them um, because they fail to learn how to do business um, honestly and without subsidies, uh, which uh, uh, turns out frequently to be uh, to be uh, uh, very bad for their business. Uh, uh, an example are fruit and vegetable growers in the United States. That's a huge agricultural business, uh, but they receive virtually no subsidies under the farm bill or very, very small ones. And they're financially better off and healthier than, than the big corn growers and, and soy growers uh, who, who get these massive payments. Uh, and and have become dependent on them. And that's just bad for them as well as for all the rest of us. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I interviewed farmers out in the Midwest about the farm bill, you know, farmers who got subsidies and farmers who didn't. And what we've created is an economy in the Midwest that is so reliant on these subsidies that if they went away, it wouldn't just affect the farmers who have come to rely on them. Um, but they're, you know, the tractor salesmen and the, you know, you name it, the, all of the stores in the, in the towns around these farms all know when the farmers get their subsidies and, and the economy goes up. Well, that's really weird. And it has nothing to do with reality. That's government money coming in to subsidize farmers who don't need it. And it affects the, the whole local and regional economy. So I think to Phil's point, you know, we should, I'm in favor of letting people do whatever they want. If people want to have a sports team, great. If people want to have a big farm and make a lot of money, great. But just don't ask us taxpayers to give you some money to make it work. Make it on your own, you know, initiative. That's my biggest frustration with it is why, you know, we're encouraging the wrong behavior. Here, here. Absolutely. And they don't even ask taxpayers because your book makes it very clear that often it is a very obfuscated how some people get this money and it's, it's hard for people if they don't spend like two years like you did to find out what's what really is happening mm -hmm. but right now and asking about like maybe an estimate about like the size of this problem because surely it is a big problem but right now we're living in a world where trillions of dollars are being thrown around and nobody knows what these numbers mean anymore they are not really something that we can grasp or understand mm -hmm. however all of that money is being spent and it's really worrisome, but do you have an idea how much the US government spends on subsidies in a given year and what the economic effects are? Well, it, it's very hard to come up with a figure and I'll tell you, well, first of all, the, the problem is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. That I think is, is quite clear. A few years ago, the Cato Institute uh, estimated $100 billion just on corporate welfare. And corporate welfare is, is only a, a relatively small a part of the total. But there's some gray areas here. If the federal government, for example, uh, uh, were to provide a subsidy to an individual energy company, uh, say Exxon Mobil, uh, that would be something we would count as welfare for the rich. But if they were to provide a tax break to all energy companies, uh, that wouldn't be quite so bad because at least uh, the energy companies would be competing with each other uh, more or less evenly. Uh, if the federal government was to give a tax break to all businesses, uh, we'd be in favor of that, uh, um, as we're generally in favor of lower taxes. But uh, in between those areas, there are some things that would count as subsidies uh, to the wealthy uh, and some things that are borderline that, that uh, uh, may simply be uh, public policy that uh, is not heavily biased or sharply focused. Uh, that makes estimating the total um, uh, virtually impossible, uh, but it's big, no question. I did an interview down in Louisiana with a, um, an organization that was fighting some of this. And the guy who leads the organization said he knew he was onto something when he thought he was reading the word millionaire 
or millions of dollars and realized that it was a B with, you know, billions with a B. He said he realized how big the problem was at that point. And that, that was sort of my experience as well. As we went through this book, the numbers just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I just thought, wow, this is so much money that could be spent on such better things than than making the rich richer. 100% and uh, it's sometimes very unclear also because you are writing about the tax code and how complicated it is and how it sometimes benefits wealthy individuals. And uh, I mean, as somebody who has to pay taxes now in the United States myself, it is impossible to understand that. and, and all the opportunities that opportunities that one could take advantage of, and it always benefits like uh, more affluent people with an army of lawyers more than uh, people who just have like a normal income. But we have also questions from the audience that I will sometimes call upon because we are live on on YouTube and other platforms. And I see that uh, Freda Levy is asking a question. Uh, she's asking both of you if you have tried to meet with legislators on this because your book has many different examples and i'm sure that the media and politicians might be interested in this but uh, she says that often legislators says like oh these subsidies are important because they create jobs and that's like the main argument against it and so she did it in the past um, she has met with folks on this but it's a very tough battle but have you both met with legislators on this and what's your experience been if you if you did I actually interviewed some local legislators because some of the stories in the book are are local and then some of them are national. And you're right. The the argument they'll give you is, oh, well, we're going to create so many jobs, you know, that's important to bring, you know, to grow our economy. Uh, Or they'll um, they'll just sort of avoid the question, quite honestly, because we we both know how the game is played. So you can talk to them about it, but they're not going to give you they're not going to say, well, you know, I got one hundred thousand dollars from my campaign. <laughs> and that's why these guys got a subsidy. So um, it's not easy. But there are some, especially a couple of retired uh, congressmen that I interviewed were pretty honest about the system. You know, they, they said, yeah, it's not it, it's whoever can get in the door and talk to us and money doesn't buy necessarily policy, but it buys time with legislators and it buys, you know, the opportunity to meet with them. Whereas if you're not a donor, if you're not going to these events, if you're not, um, if you don't have that kind of visibility in their world, they're not going to, they're not going to hear from you. So, but the retired ones are more likely to be honest about it and say, yeah, it's a bad system and it should be reformed. Those who are still in officers protecting their, their turf. I'm a little embarrassed to say I have not lobbied. I have not sat sat down with with uh, members of Congress on these issues. Uh, I've written a number of letters. I've tried to make my voice heard, um, um, but I'm not a lobbyist. I'm not very good at it, um, and there are people who are. Um, so we do what we can uh, in in other ways, like writing a book, for example. And I think you're living your comparative advantage by running several businesses, a nonprofit, and writing five books. So I think you're, you're plenty business, uh, busy, Phil. But um, this will give ammunition to folks who then can go to lawmakers and legislators and hopefully convince them to get rid of some of these laws. And Phil, you well, have an more, alluding... Oh, please sorry, go ahead. One more point about that is that the last chapter of our book is all about how to fight back. And it talks a lot about um, different organizations that are doing things to um, make this issue more uh, understandable. And for me, the most exciting thing is all the big data stuff that's happening right now. So for example, there's a couple organizations that open the books.gov, the Sunlight Foundation, the Environmental Working Group that are putting all of this spending or trying to put all of this spending online in real time. So you can get online and see what's happening both locally and nationally. And to me, having all that information is, is, is a great start to start to fight back. I mean, if you don't know where the money's going, you can't really argue about it. But once you can see where it's going, then you can start to make a plan. And there are success stories in the book. I mean, it's not all gloom and doom. We do have stories of, uh, you know, of where people did fight back and, and win. So it's not all, it's not all bad news. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would encourage our listeners and viewers to, to check out those, those resources. Um, I've used some of that for my own PhD research and it's fantastic how much more clarity you can get Um, what government is doing looking at those things and that's an important new area where we as people who believe in smaller government and a transparent government can really make a difference Mm -hmm. but now phil you you have been alluding to this fact that no one from the left to the right to classical liberals likes welfare for the rich however subsidies continue to exist they continue to grow 
But why is that? We recently had also an author here, Dr. Zittelman, who we talked about like the opinion about rich people. And he showed that very often they are negatively viewed, more positively in the United States, but much worse in, the, in France or in, in Germany compared to other quote unquote minorities. And people are very skeptical about the rich. And we see this right now in rhetoric and protests and eat the rich and all that kind of stuff. So if there's a lot of skepticism, why don't we see more actions towards getting rid of these subsidies and talking about some of these more, these abuses where billionaires get more millions in their pocket for owning some land that has maybe some agricultural use? Why, why do you think there's no more movement on tackling these issues? Well, uh the self-interest of the various parties who benefit from these, uh, from these um, uh, subsidies and tax breaks um, tends to be well expressed and rather intensely expressed in the form of lobbying of various kinds. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with lobbying in principle either. Uh, but the result is that a small program perhaps gets started uh, a, 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 and gets a little bigger. Uh, a, another program uh, may uh, be initiated by a congressman, for example, in a different part of the country who wants his constituents to be treated just as well uh, as the one who has the subsidy. And bit by bit by bit, uh, these subsidies uh, begin to accumulate. And uh, uh, as Milton Friedman once remarked, there is nothing more permanent than a temporary Washington program. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible to kill these. If, if a congressman suggests to his or her fellow congresspersons uh, that a particular uh, program be ended, uh, everyone is screaming immediately that, that some people will lose their jobs. It's a, a classic case of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs because every taxpayer in the country may pay 87 cents a year, uh, but a, a concentrated benefit may be worth several million dollars to whoever is benefiting. Uh, it's very, very hard to kill these programs. Uh, we cite a, a, a story in the book uh, from Jonathan Rausch's uh, approach about the wool and mohair subsidy program, which nobody, it, it, it was a program based on the need for uh, wool and mohair to make uh, uniforms in World War II. And 30 years later, nobody really tried to defend these programs. And eventually, uh, uh, they, Congress actually eliminated them. They, they as, as Rausch says, one of the first times in the history of, of, of subsidies that this occurred. Uh, but one year later, Congress came back and replaced it with something that was named differently, but benefited the same uh, uh, Angora goat uh, herders and, and uh, uh, wool. Uh, uh, workers uh, with another program that pretty much uh, took the place of the one that had been eliminated. So even when Congress manages to eliminate something, they feel so badly about it, uh, or the the uh, the losing constituents um, scream so loudly that they tend to come back uh, and reintroduce it. It's very very hard. Um, it's easy to get a new subsidy started and almost impossible to get an old one stopped. As well, there's, a there's a statistic I like to cite that for every dollar you spend in Washington on lobbying, you get $760 back. So it's pretty lucrative for people who can afford to do it. And it explains why people lobby. I mean, it's so, you know, what a great return on investment. <laughs> That's fascinating. What would you say as a counter argument to people who would say, we do need lobbying? because the federal government has grown to such an extent they regulate everything in our lives and they cannot have the expertise to know how to regulate complex financial product like mortgage-backed security appropriately vis-a-vis -vis how to regulate, I don't know, Tesla as a new auto company with like new batteries in there. They need to have expertise in all of these different areas. Don't they need the access of businesses to give them better advice? How would you tackle that argument? Well, um, some lobbying 
is helpful. Uh, some lobbying does impart expert expertise uh, to legislatures that they need in order to make sensible decisions about policies toward things like uh, electric cars, as, as you suggest. Uh, but invariably, this turns to or includes uh, a subsidy form of uh, favoritism toward the party doing the, uh, doing the lobbying. And subsidies, generally speaking, as we've already suggested, are overwhelmingly bad. Um, um, but there's no, no need to talk about doing away with lobbying because it's in the First Amendment to the Constitution and uh, uh, it is perfectly legal and I th believe it always will be. Yeah, that's a hard one because you do want to give people the right to free speech and go in and you know lobby for their address of grievances. But at the same time, what that's opened the door to is going in and asking for special favors. So it's it's a tough one. That's a conundrum. Yeah, and there's so many different interest groups that sometimes pull in different directions, which also make the laws more incoherent because mm -hmm. you give like a little bit to that interest group and then you have like the opposing voice and then you end up with laws that uh, trying to do too much or to uh, really uh, antithetical towards the goal of, of creating clear rules because we often don't have that because government tends to make everything more complicated um, to put it simply. Um, we have another question from somebody from the audience um, from Dr. Rudolf King and he asked a question about the infant industry argument. So for the audience who doesn't know what that is, it's basically saying like, hey, um, maybe like a country that's just developing, they have an industry within microchips, but they don't have the capacity to compete with the United States or Singapore, who already have very established uh, markets within microchips. So therefore, the government says like, we have to give them a couple of billions for a couple of years so that they can grow to an extent so that they can compete in worldwide markets. Now, is there, from your point of view, if you've studied this, is there evidence that this works and that those firms actually become productive and give some of that subsidy back? Or is it generally a waste of money to invest in companies like that? It's, it is generally a waste of money. Um, the history on, uh, on such investments by government is quite bad. The history of investments by private parties uh, by private capital is is generally good and absolutely essential. Uh, when a developing economy, when the government of a developing economy welcomes foreign investment, uh, reduces uh, favoritism, uh, cuts back on their uh, on their tariffs, and generally makes it uh, attractive to invest in businesses in that country. Uh, uh, the results have overwhelmingly been, been good. I mean, uh, this was very true in, in India, particularly parts of India. Uh, they had horribly high tariffs, didn't welcome uh, uh, foreign companies, and those policies all changed during the 90s, improved greatly, liberalized greatly, and uh, all of a sudden the Indian economy started to grow. Uh, and we've seen this... In, in a number of other countries as well. So that uh, private investment, welcoming private investment and making it attractive uh, for private parties to invest, then that private money is going to be very carefully invested and invested in things that are likely to succeed. Whereas when governments pump money in, uh, it generally uh, causes nothing but trouble, particularly when the government uh, supplies money to other governments. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think also, you know, I mean, just think about it in your own personal life. If, you, if you're spending your own money, you're a lot more careful with it than if you're spending someone else's money, you know? So I think that private investment, they're looking for a return and it's their own money on the line, whereas government tends to see it as, oh, well, we'll invest and, you know, we're not really responsible for it. It's not our money, it's the taxpayer's money. Um, so there's less uh, and, and less expertise. Somebody privately investing probably knows something about what it is they're investing in. Whereas the governments can't know about, as you said before, governments can't know everything about everything. So they should stay out of it. 
Agreed. And we've been touching on this, but what would you say are the main ways how these subsidies come about? Because often they even benefit a very, very narrow group of people or sometimes even individuals. Is this mostly done through um, 501c4s? Um, this is, these are like legal entities in the United States that are allowed to do lobbying or is it mostly through lobbyists di directly that they're working with legislators or is it with these individuals that are buddy-buddy with the with the politician in question. Um, what have you learned about the process how most of these subsidies come about? Well, it varies. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Well, I think it varies depending on the issue, but for the most part, it's it, it, the lobbying is a lot of it. It's it's uh, you know it's going into your local or state or national you know legislators and saying, hey, you know, I want to, I need some money to get this stadium built or I need some money to get this film. <laughs> paid for or this data center built. Uh, and despite a remarkable amount of evidence at this point that these are a bad idea, legislators just get sucked into it over and over again with the promise of jobs because jobs look good when they're running for office again. They can say, oh, you know, I did this deal with Amazon and now we're gonna have 150 new jobs come in. But what, what astounds me is how little oversight there is after it's done, like after the subsidy is given away and we said, OK, we'll give you this money, but you have to sh you know, provide 150 jobs or a thousand jobs. Seldom did I run across studies about how many jobs were actually created. And when studies were done, then it was pretty obvious what a bad investment it was. But it's amazing how many local and state legislators just never go back and see whether the promises were kept. Um, so that's a problem, but you know, th there's so many different ways that these come about. At this point, we have so many that are ingrained in law that unless somebody fights back about it, for example, the NASCAR tax subsidy has been around for years, but it's just, it's renewed every year and nobody says boo about it. There's another tax subsidy for race horses. So if you, <laughs> if you wanna, if you wanna race a horse, you can get a subsidy for that. Um, and the farm bill has been around since 1932. And it just gets every four years, people make a little bit of noise, but it gets renewed anyway. So it's those ones that have been around for a long time that are probably the hardest and probably the most expensive also. I mean, the farm bill is enormously expensive, uh, but it's got a lot of moving parts. So it'd be hard to hard to get rid of it. Yeah, frequently this, um, um, what we think is a shibboleth of um, creating new jobs uh, a program would be suggested requiring a subsidy. Uh, uh, and even in the, in the proposal, the cost per new job is simply ridiculous. Um, um, Lisa uncovered several cases where uh, it, it costs something like $160,000 uh, per new job um, uh, before the program even got started. Well, that, it, as using job creation under those circumstances is, is simply ridiculous. Uh, this continues to happen, however. Yeah, those are fantastic points that we should more think about. If a politician says like, oh, we want to create more jobs, everybody is clapping and is excited about that, but what does that mean? Um, you have been evoking Milton Friedman during this conversation and that always brings to mind this example, like if you want to create jobs, give people instead of a shovel give them spoons to dig some ditches and uh, is that productive usage of taxpayers money or how to create jobs um, i would venture to say uh, absolutely not and another question that we have from the from the audience uh, from uh, yukta man yunat um, she says that the united states of course spends a lot of money on medicaid and medicare and i think this raises the, the bigger question how often do programs that are intended for the least fortunate in society end up benefiting also richer individuals? Because I know, for instance, that I know very affluent people who benefit from Medicaid and Medicare as well, and they don't really need it. Um, do you have some examples along those lines where programs intended for poorer individuals end up also benefiting the rich? Well, in, in fairness, uh... Medicare is not intended for poor people. It's intended for everybody. And we all get rather heavily taxed throughout our working life um, uh, to pay for it, although uh, we're falling behind in that regard. Medicare uh, is now a huge part of the federal budget. Medicaid is intended for poor people. Uh, 
uh, I don't have offhand. We didn't uh, we didn't dig into this one very far. Uh, any examples of how Medicaid benefits are going to rich people? But I have no doubt that it that it is. Um, the tendency uh, of programs for the poor or or for let us say small entities to end up in the pockets of the big and rich entities is, is very, very strong. Uh, we've seen that in the contemporary situation uh, with the CARES Act, with the uh, money appropriated uh, as a result of um, the pandemic disaster, uh, the PPP program, the payroll protection uh, program, for example, was designed for small businesses to help small businesses keep their uh, their payrolls going during the pandemic, uh, but um, uh, uh, the limit was supposed to be 500 employees, which is a not terribly small business, but at least it isn't a giant business. Uh, however, very early in that program, and this is all quite recent, uh, several hotel and restaurant chains jumped in and, uh, and they were allowed to do so um, the, um, um, uh, one of the, one of the biggest restaurant chains, uh, got a $10 million loan right off the bat. Uh, they had 10,000 employees, not 500. Um, and, uh, there was a bit of, a, of a kickback probably from their own customers. Uh, uh, questioning this, and they were sufficiently embarrassed about it to return the money, to give them credit where credit is due. Um, but the, the point here is that a lot of um, uh, subsidy payments designed to help the small and the low income uh, end up in the pockets of the rich just because they're better connected. They have better banking relations. They can they can fight their way through the red tape and the form filling out uh, for the small business administration and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, uh, small business money there thereby uh, has a tendency to end up with big businesses. But to to get back to your uh, the the question that was posed about, you know, whether, you know, money that's meant for poor people is going to rich people. In our first book, uh, Human Cost of Welfare, we looked at all the welfare programs in the country. And, you know, there is that sort of myth of the of the with the welfare queen or the, you know, the person taking advantage of welfare programs. Um, and there was some of that, but, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling the country interviewing people on welfare and I didn't really find much of that, except for interestingly enough, in the medical area, where doctors would, um, you know, sign up pe poor people for for various procedures and then not do the procedures and then bill Medicaid for them. So there was that kind of thing going on, but it was more the wealthy physicians that were doing that kind of stuff than than the person you know the, who's living on welfare that was able to game the system and gain any any great amount of money from it. <clears throat> Thank you for evoking that that book, Lisa, because I have it somewhere also here in my bookshelf, um, and it's it's fantastic. And most people, when they hear welfare, they think it's positive, it's helping people. But you made in that book, um, if I'm not mistaken, a strong claim that it's often like much more harmful than beneficial to individuals. And right now, welfare spending is like one of the biggest components of the federal budget in the United States and most countries around the world. Can you um, succinctly summarize, like, why did you come to that conclusion? Because I know both of you are helping people actively in your, in your personal life and you want to help the unfortunate folks. But why do you think that the government and welfare programs are not the best way of going about this? Well, in, in this country, uh, and I expect it is true to some extent in, uh, in all countries, uh, we found that the biggest flaw, the biggest weakness of the welfare program was that it did nothing to help people get back to work and indeed incentivized them in many cases uh, against getting back to work. Uh, uh, Lisa interviewed one man who was a regular recipient of welfare and he said, I go to the welfare office 
and there are posters on the wall for other welfare programs. He said they should have job posting, not more welfare posting. And uh, this was a man who uh, uh, eventually did get a job uh, and became demonstrably happier as a result to actually be working. Uh, but the system tends to self-perpetuate uh, people, the welfare bureaucracy kind of likes to get more people into their own uh, program uh, mm -hmm. with the result that there are often incentives uh, to stay on welfare, to get on welfare, and very, very little effort uh, to get people back to work and give them jobs. That is a serious flaw in, in the system. Uh, and one of the reasons it is held in such low repute. Uh, as Lisa says, the, the welfare queen issue compared to that is fairly, is fairly minor. Yeah. And that's the thing, the people that I interviewed on welfare all over the country said they'd much rather be working, but the penalty for, for taking a job and losing all their welfare benefits was just too high because as soon as they got a job, every all their benefits went away and they couldn't afford to, you know, you know, make up for all the things that they would lose, their health care, their housing, their food, their, you know, all of these programs. So there's no, you know, well, if you go on welfare, you just tend to stay poor instead of having a welfare system that gets you out of poverty. We have a welfare system that just sort of holds you in poverty and wants to keep you there. Yeah, and I think uh, it's also the, the, the case that people have to spend most of their time, like a full-time job to apply for these things, to report in and to get all of these grants. So there's like a huge cost of like people just wasting time in order to report to these agencies so that they feel legitimized to give this money so that there is not like a welfare queen story. Um, and that is really unfortunate. I would encourage um, all of our listeners and viewers to also check out the more expensive definitions of unemployment, for instance, because often unemployment, if they report it, it does not include long-term unemployment. So people who are not who stopped looking for jobs, they're not part of that unemployment number. That is U6, if you look at the uh, like Bureau of Labor statistic. And I think normally they report U3. And so that's it even shields like all of the other pain and suffering that's behind that and people living on welfare for many generations. And there are better ways of, of helping the poor. And I'm glad that you wrote that book because most people think like this is necessary. We have to grow it. We have to fight um, the war against poverty um, as it has been coined in the past but it often has more negative consequences um, compared to if we were doing this like more on the local level or having churches and nonprofits uh, take, take charge of that. Mm -hmm. But let me shift gears here a little bit because you're also talking on the book about the role of tariffs and how they're also benefiting, benefiting the rich. And you're quoting uh, Donald Trump in there who's just like, I'm a tariff guy and we all know this. And it has been very surprising to me as a classical liberal uh, economist that a staple of our ideas, which was like tariffs are bad, reduce them, it will benefit everyone, lift all boats. All of that was somewhat thrown out of the, the window once Trump got elected and even conservatives and, and classic liberals, libertarians were suddenly asking like, eh, China's playing unfair, we should be also um, using tariffs. And how do you see this? Um, is this tariffs generally antithetical to growth within a country? And also, what are the effects on the welfare for the rich from your point of view? Well, the, the, the best summation of this phenomenon that we've come across, and we quote him in the book, is that uh, in wartime, you set up a blockade to prevent your enemy from importing things that he may need to pursue the war said in peacetime you impose tariffs in order to do to yourself what your enemies do to you during wartime. I mean, tariffs are self-destructive almost automatically. Um, and uh, I think uh, Trump has changed uh, uh, attitudes on this subject very widely. The fact that he imposed these idiotic tariffs does not necessarily mean that people like them and a lot of people have suffered from them very substantially, particularly certain categories of farmers. But before Trump got started, we had and still have 17,000 items 
in what is called the harmonized tariff schedule, uh, which Lisa had to look at. It, I think it has 900 and some pages and unbelievable number of chapters and minutia on things like the, the number of eyelets in shoes to distinguish them from other kinds of shoes. 17,000 items we charge tariffs on, and uh, it, it's included in our book because the way the, that tariff schedule has turned out, it favors the wealthy over the poor. Uh, we have the highest tariffs on things that low-income people need and use, that is food and clothing, and inexpensive shoes, and the lowest tariffs uh, on things that are more expensive, and uh, interest to low-income people, things like water skis and, and uh, cross-country skis and uh, $500 watches, which many of which uh, uh, don't involve any tariffs at all. Now, how this has come about is mind-bogglingly mysterious because I don't think Congress ever sat down and said, well, let's design a tariff schedule that that is bad for poor people and good for rich people, but that's how it's turned out. That's how these piecemeal, one thing at a time, uh, um, somebody, I presume hypothetically, uh, who was making inexpensive canvas shoes uh, at some point wanted uh, uh, to keep competition out and managed to get a tariff on inexpensive canvas shoes uh, but we don't have very many expensive leather shoemakers in this country, I guess, uh, so that expensive Italian shoes uh, have a much lower tariff rate. I mean, it's, it, it's quite nonsensical, insupportable, and, and completely stupid. Um, but like other things that we have mentioned, it's very, very hard to change these things. Uh, but we do get asked, you know, what would you do? And my answer is very, very short. I'd get rid of all tariffs, every kind of tariff, including Trump's tariffs, including especially Trump's tariffs, and then all 17,000 of the other items because they, they, they harm us. They make us pay more for everything um, and do no good except for a very small handful of, of uh, uh, sharply targeted interests, um, uh, and then only for a very limited period of time, they should simply be eliminated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, and also the tariffs. So back before we had an income tax, we paid for our federal government with tariffs. That's how we funded funded our, you know, national budgets. And then a long time ago, we realized how, how what a bad idea that was. So we, you know, got rid of tariffs for the most part. And, and change to a, an income tax and we all can hate income taxes, but it seems a little bit more logical than tariffs. But now we have a system where we not only have income tax, but we also have these tariffs that are costing us money. And studies have shown that at this point, tariffs are costing each American about $600 a year because every product that you buy that has a tariff on it is now costing you more. So the idea that tariffs are somehow going to hurt these manufacturers in China or wherever is just simply not the case. They add that cost of whatever product it is that you're buying onto the cost of the product. And we, the taxpayer, the consumer are actually paying the cost of those tariffs. So they're, they're just a bad idea all the way around. Absolutely. So 17,000 tariffs and the annual cost of right now is $600, which probably does not even include like the costs of all of the people who are enforcing these tariffs and documenting on it and reporting on it. Um, mm -hmm. So that is really atrocious. Um, so why do you think that this argument suddenly has become so much more favorable? Because it seems very nonsensical. You are demonstrating the cost, but people say like, hey, China is playing unfair, whatever that means. We also have to do this, we as in the United States. Why do you think it had become like such a, got a, such a huge appeal, especially with people that normally previously would have disagreed with this argument? I can't answer that one, but I can say that, you know, there are people agreeing with a lot of the stuff that's coming out of this administration that to me seems utterly absurd. So <laughs> I don't know if that's just one of them, but I, 
I think it's people who don't understand, you know, the cost to themselves and they, they don't actually understand what's happening. They just want to see somebody punished because of the, yeah, whatever. I can't come up with an explanation for that one. No, I think it's, it's just, uh, you know, China is not playing fair, so we've got to do something equally stupid. Mm -hmm. um, it, I'm not a big fan of, of sanctions either, but if we're trying to do something to convince China to liberalize its trade policies and they need liberalizing, no question about that, I, I think that sanctions are probably a less bad alternative than imposing tariffs on Chinese products. It's a complicated subject, but uh, um, tariffs are self-harming almost by definition. We're doing to ourselves what enemies would like to do to us uh, to harm us, and uh, we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, and it seems also to me that often people don't look at the unseen, as, as Bastiat would say. They see like, okay, now we have fewer products in China from China coming in or from whatever other country. Therefore, we will have like more local industry producing the same goods. While that makes sense to some extent, we have to look at the data if that really pans out that way. You ignore that probably this country has a comparative advantage, they can do it cheaper, and it ignores all of the money that is now in the hands in the pockets of the Americans now that benefit from having a cheap, having to pay less money on this particular product and they could spend it on something else. And that is generally better for the economy. And um, yeah, it, it is a fascinating question. And I have been wrestling with that myself. I would say it has more something to do with what you said, Lisa. It's, it's more about people look at the person in charge instead of focusing on principles or the ideas behind it. And then suddenly everything that like one person says, you cannot criticize them because like the other ideas that you associate with that individual gets undermined. It's definitely, it's definitely tricky, but it was surprising to me to see this. And uh, a very, very good example of um, was with solar panels. Um, there was an industry growing fairly rapidly installing solar panels in the Western part of the country uh, using very inexpensive Chinese panels. And we decided to slap a big tariff on Chinese solar panels so they'd be made here in the United States. And it devastated the business of installing them because it had suddenly become uh, to, to install solar panels on a, on a wide scale. So they can be very destructive, even in the short run. Absolutely. And uh, you've been alluding to, to this, that there is some hope, that there are some organizations that work on this. So is there hope to get rid of terrorism subsidies? And if yes, what would you say is the main way of getting rid of those? Well, Lisa's already cited a few of the organizations that follow uh, all of this. And uh, we, we are fans of um, the Sunlight Foundation and uh, Good Jobs First and Open the Books uh, because they provide information um, um, about all of, uh, of these kinds of payments uh, in some detail and that is a very good first step. Uh, we also favor, and here it's, uh, I'm afraid, not, do as, not doing as I, as I say, but I, I still recommend, and I know Lisa does even more strongly, uh, starting to get involved in your own local politics. In other words, the more people we have uh, who are active in their community, which is particularly difficult these days, I understand that, but if you begin to understand how change can be brought about um, in your local community, uh, sometimes county level, sometimes just a village or a town, uh, you learn how working together with other people uh, can actually change policies and change laws. So we are strong advocates of that. I'm no good at doing it myself. I don't much like 
community action on a personal level. I'd rather stay home. But uh, a lot of people do like it, and a lot of people are very good at it, uh, and, and uh, we're happy to uh, uh, to recommend it. But it's a long slog. I mean, it's like freedom. Uh, it's a constant, never-ending battle uh, because encroachments on freedom are going to be never-ending. Um, and the same is true uh, of, of self-interested lobbying. Um, the, the only answer is to keep working on it and to keep uh, um, involving as many people as you can, including yourself, uh, in the in the process of making laws and policies, um, it's there. There is no solution except to keep doing it. I think I'd agree with that. And also, all those organizations provide so much great information. But then I think that the other piece of it is people who can write about it and who can tell those stories and make them interesting. And, you know, it's one thing to read on a database, oh, wow, $100 million just went to that company. It's another thing to read about it in the newspaper where a journalist has made it into an interesting story that can get the outrage going in the community. And so I think that people in media, journalists, writers, you know, people doing books, whatever the case may be, where you can sort of generate that outrage and get people super excited or angry, uh, oftentimes angry, about the situation, which is how you get change. Um, and that, you know, what you're doing with your education of students, whether or whether it's a, you know, a TV show or another book or whatever it is, the more of that that's going on, the more, I mean, people who've read this book have just been outraged. They just had no idea how big this problem was. And and we certainly didn't before we we started this book. I thought I had a pretty good idea of, of how bad the situation was. I'm sure Phil did too. And by the end of it, we're just going, oh my gosh, is there anybody in America who's wealthy who isn't getting, getting some of my tax dollars? This is ridiculous. So, you know, it takes all of us getting getting angry to, to start to make change, I think, and using anger in a positive way, not just pitching a fit. That's, that's a wonderful way how we can conclude this because one of the things that we are instilling in our students is that they can take charge, that they have the power to make a difference in the world. And we have plenty of evidence of that because just in the last year, our students have organized 2,700 events with over 120,000 people worldwide. And we have students who then became journalists and wrote about this or wrote about like how some local policies undermine property rights and made a difference in that way. And uh, your examples of becoming involved in local politics make sense. We should not always look at, at government to fix everything because that means non-action. It just means you vote, but your impact is very limited in this regard. But if you write about something, write a book or write a scholarly article or write a newspaper article about this or come up with a TV show, publish like a new The Wire, um, mm -hmm. which I'm watching right now, which goes into details also about these incentives and how subsidies come about. All of those are avenues how we as individuals can make a difference to push away um, some of these bad ideas that lead to rich people becoming richer for no good reason because they don't produce value, but because they get taxpayers' money from the government. So I applaud you once again. Thank you so much for writing this book. Um, everyone, get it. Welfare for the Rich, Amazon, everywhere else you can get it. Uh, read it, understand it, write about it, complain about it to your local legislator. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our audience. This uh, will continue to be in the internet and hopefully many more people will change their mind on subsidies subsequently and make a difference. Thank you. Both. I, I, I think the book has got a version on sale at Amazon now, and you can look inside and read the first 50 pages under their uh, regular arrangement. So we invite you all to do that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks everyone for asking questions, for being here. And I hope all of you have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks, Wolf. Thanks, Wolf. Okay.